I want to talk about what I believe to be one of the serious problems affecting the U.S. national science infrastructure, the enduring, indeed worsening funding challenges that are facing young investigators in the United States. Data points to the gravity of this problem. Most scientists doing biomedical research in the United States are supported by grants from the National Institutes of Health. The R01 is the leading National Institutes of Health research grant and a prerequisite to a career as an independent investigator. We know that the average age at which an investigator with a medical degree receives her first R01 or equivalent grant has risen from less than 38 years old in 1980 to more than 45 in 2013. We know that the number of principal investigators for R01s who are 35 years old or younger declined from 18% in 1983 to less than 2% in 2014. And the problem extends beyond the R01 as well. The percent of all grant funding awarded to scientists from the NIH under the age of 36 has dropped from 5.6% in 1980 to 1.3% 1 in 2012. These numbers are alarming, and they demand action. Now, of course, behind the numbers lies a real human toll to this problem. Those of us at universities are regularly confronted by the wrenching harm of, all of our failure to address this issue. We see this when we look at the effect on early career scientists in a number of different ways. The exceptionally talented faculty members who cannot obtain funding and leave academic research for positions in industry who leave the country for opportunities in other countries where they're well-funded, or most alarmingly, who leave science altogether. And of course, there are the students who would have come into uh, biomedical research but decide to pursue other careers because they're aware of the obstacles ahead. The departure of a generation of scientists from the academic biomedical workforce in turn poses grave risks for the future of science. The dangers are many and include the gradual evaporation of a pipeline of new discoveries and therapeutics that can make significant differences in the lives of patient populations, the loss of a generation of future leaders and mentors in science, a delay in the introduction of greater diversity in the biomedical workforce, because after all, we know that we have to bring in new people from diverse backgrounds to replace the generation that is retiring. And if one looks at paradigm shifts in science, the path-breaking discoveries that advance our understanding of the world accelerate the development of innovative approaches to medicine that save lives and improve the human condition. The linkage of youth with these major scientific breakthroughs has been confirmed in a number of different studies. Finally, Compare this to how we treat the ideas of early career professionals in other industries, in areas such as technology and software and finance, where we've created pathways for the young to create and lead with platforms for innovation, advancement, and opportunity. We send important signals that this is an arena where people entering this uh, setting will be welcomed and their career aspirations supported. And yet, in academic medicine, our funding challenges send a very different signal and seem to tell our students that the promising opportunities, the fertile avenues for discovery are disappearing. So what are the causes of this problem? How did we get here? First, I think it's really important to emphasize that this is not a new problem. About a decade or so ago, the National Academy of Sciences published a report by a blue ribbon panel of scientists called Bridges to Independence that identified several of the problems I discussed earlier and proposed a number of solutions. And yet, the data that I chronicled earlier has only gotten worse since these articles and reports. Now, are the proposed solutions flawed or are there policy barriers to making these changes? Or is there some other issue that explains our lack of progress on this issue? These are among the questions that we need to unravel in thinking through a good and durable solution to this problem. Second, I want to underscore that this is not an easy problem. The problem is complex and multifactorial. The national science funding ecosystem has many interlocking parts and a complicated set of stakeholders and incentives. 
And of course, it has been enormously successful to date, and in truth, for all of its frailties and challenges, it is still a model that is emulated by other countries around the world. Now, that's not to say that we can be complacent or that there is not a need to change. Indeed, it is imperative that we consider and take steps to refine our system. It is just to say that any changes we make should be exercised with care and in the finest traditions of the very science we are seeking to support based on sound data and assessment. With that in mind, what are the likely causes? One obvious candidate is a substantial contraction in IH funding over the last decade. That uh, decrease has been substantial. It is uh, by more than 20% in real terms over the last decade. And there is no question that that has had a real impact. There is less funding for all, a problem that reverberates throughout the biomedical workforce, and of course can have a particular impact on early investigators. But even in the time of doubling of NIH funding around the turn of the 21st century, we saw that the data for young investigators worsening. So when times are good or times are bad, young investigators still have not been holding up well in terms of the receipt of NIH funding. So there must be something else going on. Another possible explanation is the impact of longer training periods. Scientists emerge from their postdocs much older than they used to be, and so they can be expected to be older when they obtain their first grants. The data indicates that this explains some, but not all the problem that we see in the data. And of course, even if it does explain part of the problem, there is reason to doubt that this is a healthy thing. Some have argued that a body of scientific knowledge has grown over time, that is the body of scientific knowledge rather has grown over time, and young investigators need to train for longer periods to obtain the level of required mastery to support robust independent research. However, I'm really skeptical that this mastery hypothesis offers a compelling reason to tolerate a delay in funding for young scientists. The library of scientific knowledge has been expanding for centuries, and yet there was a time in the very recent past when we felt comfortable in trusting even our youngest scientists with scientific independence, independence and a faculty position, and didn't feel that they had to spend time in laborious training programs before they were eligible to compete for funds. A third explanation is what I call incumbency advantage, or the idea that there is something endemic to the grant application and selection process that disadvantages early career investigators um, in comparison to other scientists. And these disadvantages can be due to everything from the complexity of the application process to the ways in which the peer review process can favor established actors, to the catch-22 of the need for preliminary data to obtain an R01, but the difficulty of obtaining preliminary data without an R01. So what do we do to address this challenge? We need to use an evidence-based and scientific approach to solving this problem. In light of the complexity of the problem, I don't believe that we should favor any one great idea, one single instrument to re drive reform in this area. We should be in the mode of active experimentation and hypothesis testing and consider a range of possible solutions. The problem is complex and multifactorial, and ultimately, the remedies that we propose are going to have to be complex and involve a range of different initiatives. So here, in thinking about the things that we can do to tackle the issue of funding for young scientists, we should uh, train our sites on three broad actors, Congress, the NIH, and then, of course, other stakeholders in the system, like research universities with which I am affiliated. With regard to Congress, as I noted, the fate of early career investigators is at least in part a function of the decline in congressional appropriations that has diminished the purchasing power of the NIH by more than 20% over the last decade. This has had a profound effect on scientific funding, as I said earlier. And here, Congress let this situation unfold, and so too it is only Congress that has the ability to change the trajectory of funding. And in fact, in recent months, we have seen uh, the House pass legislation to increase core NIH funding and develop new funding streams for young scientists. This is really encouraging and that we hope 
that the Senate will follow and train and that ultimately we will be able to restore uh, funding to the uh, levels that we saw at the turn of the century. Now, assuming that Congress is able to remedy the funding challenges that the NIH and all the stakeholders in the system experience, then of course one wants to take a look at the ways in which the NIH funds the system, the way it allocates the funds that it receives. Here, one area of possible reform lies in a greater emphasis on people-based rather than grant-based research funding. Now, the classic example of a successful people-based funding model comes from the Howard Hughes Medical Institutes. Indeed, Howard Hughes recently announced a new faculty scholars program with the Gates and Simons Foundations that would commit almost $150 million for young investigators with the potential to make unique contributions to their fields and give these recipients the freedom to pursue complex long-range questions. Another area of reform involves continuing to experiment with tailored grants to young investigators. Now, the NIH has, in truth, tried its hand at new funding streams of this sort in recent years. And these initiatives are laudable, but as we know, they have not yet solved the problem, and more creative approaches will be needed to overcome the structural barriers confronted by young scientists, such as incorporating milestones or opportunities for preliminary data into the grant programs for the unproven early stage investigator. Remember, it's these investigators, the unproven investigators, those who are willing to take new and arresting approaches to common challenges. These are the people that we've got to find and support and give them a chance at contributing to the development of our scientific field. Still, other areas of reform involve improving peer review. Now, this is an area that seems particularly susceptible to experimentation and data collection. And yet, one recent article noted that, quote, for a system that determines the fate of scientific proposals, peer review is remarkably unscientific. Can we experiment with changes to the voting rules or the constitution of review panels in order to try to address some of the network effects that I discussed earlier and, again, stand in the way of young scientists receiving appropriate levels of funding. And finally, this leads to my concluding point, which is some of the solutions will need to emerge from all stakeholders, including, of course, within research universities like mine. Can research universities do more to support their own biomedical workforce through changes in the way in which they structure laboratories, organize core facilities, and design postdoc fellowships? Can we find a way to compress the period for graduate training? Can we think about novel ways to compress, for instance, the long period of training for MD, PhD students? Again, if we can do this faster, we get our scientists out into the field earlier where they can compete for funding. Can we find ways to create sustainable non-faculty positions for scientific research within the academy, positions that come with status and support with proper promotional opportunities that again will lead to the professionalization of the field? Universities must lean into these problems as well as part of a true systems approach to biomedical research. And such approach looks to refine the incentives we set for the U.S. biomedical workforce at this pivotal moment so it can continue to be a model for the world for generations to come.